Welcome back, everybody. In cybersecurity, it is certain, certain and known for all that in order to keep uh, uh, to stand uh, to to uh, to stand, you have to keep on running. So similarly, for the cybersecurity index, in order for this to remain relevant, we have to regularly update the methodology, as Radu has explained to you and as Hep, Hep explained to you regarding the context. So today, it is extreme pleasure of mine to welcome here a solid panel of various experts uh, to discuss some of the mo most relevant indicators that have been updated in the current and CSI 3.0. We have Don Elzep, the Estonian Cybersecurity cyber Ambassador, we have Birgi Lorenz, the senior scientist for, talent, uh, for Taltec. We have Josep Johansson, the cybersecurity expert from CERT Estonia. And last but not least, Commander Jake Galbert, the head of the strategy branch from the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. Welcome. Um, as said, uh, we have uh, in the current NCSI 3.0, uh, the, uh, the work and the launch of today wraps up work that we've done over the past two years. Uh, starting this discussion with uh, you, Tanel, first uh, and, and touching upon something that is new in our indicators and that is the cyber diplomacy dimension. It wasn't there before. Um, this is building on the aspect that cy national cyber resilience it is not purely a domestic matter, but is growingly also requires cooperation among states, among uh, regions, and even at international level cooperation. Um, Tanel, can you tell us a little bit about the importance and relevance of cyber diplomacy engagements from national perspective? Well, thank you, Merle, for uh, first for inviting me uh, to, to this discussion. As for, for your question, um, I would like to reply to that by kind of overall notion that every country in the world is di digitalizing right now. I mean, we in Estonia, we are lucky enough to have been in forefront already for, for years. But now you can see really every single country is doing uh, its bit. And with the digital, digitization, what always has to come along is, is the cybersecurity part. The, we see so many cyber attacks against uh, uh, developing countries also now. So it is a matter to everybody. So cybersecurity really needs to be enabled there. But for me as a kind of cyber diplomat, what is really important is, is that we all should strive for more stability in cyberspace and that's why i think it's it's so relevant and important that the index also includes the cyber diplomacy part now and what does the stability mean it, it really means taking floor and voicing out uh, your own um, statements on, on international law and how that applies it is a, about cooperating on on uh, creating accountability in cyberspace because in the end as, and it's, it is so relevant for Estonia right now that if we cannot uh, ensure stability in cyberspace, that will threaten our lifestyle here because our level of digitalization, digitalization is simply so high. Sure. So uh, how do you see the trends of countries uh, spelling out in more detail how they see how international law applies in cyberspace from their national perspective? How many countries are there who have done that and where is the trend going? And not enough. Um, at the same time, I mean, I go to, to New York uh, three times a year to open and the working group meetings. That's the only global forum we have for these kind of questions. And there I can actually see as a positive trend that more and more countries are uh, taking floor and really saying out what they think. Um, and at the same time, we are also encouraging a lot of countries. So um, our development cooperation our, uh, efforts also go in, in this direction, really to, to help them to uh, bring together different entities, different ministries, to think through different topics in, in uh, cyberspace and, and also to connect this with, with their own, in, own internal politics. 
When you say you are encouraging developing countries to come together and uh, some of the efforts uh, we at the Gardens Academy have had privilege of, of joining you in organizing the Cyber Diplomacy Summer School in Tallinn. But what are some of the first steps for countries to take on that path? I mean, uh, is it that the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs should set up a cyber diplomats, uh, cyber, cyber ambassadors position? Is that something that one should consider? Is it a unit or is, is that not necessary? What is the role of ministries of foreign affairs in all of this, uh, in all of this effort? I think that the initial role is, is really to translate. Translate uh, the, the, the aspects or the developments in, in the tech world, to translate these into foreign policy language. Because um, especially what we see right now in, in Ukraine, for example, it, there has been a, a brutal kinetic war that has been accompanied with a cyber war. So in a, in a way, there is no difference if, if, if you are aggressor in kinetic or cyber world. It's the same. So creating these links between, between the, the policies and, and, or what's happening on the ground and what's happening in cyberspace and, and really uh, expressing what's happening in cyberspace in the, in the language that is understandable in political terms. Thanks for that. I very much agree and I think that uh, underlines the need to include some basic cyber security and cyber diplomacy training amongst the diplomats, uh, overall training, in order to be able to have that talent pool in the public sector who can transfer tech developments into the language of cyber diplomacy and, and, and foreign security policy uh, relevant for the country and government, right? Exactly. Uh, for me, when, I, when I'm looking for new people in my team, to join my team, then I'm not looking for, uh, for techies from whom I can, I can kind of develop diplomats, vice versa. I'm looking for diplomats who are, let's say, geeky or nerdy enough to be interested in cyber topics that, that what I really need is the diplomatic skill in, in discussing cyber matters, not vice versa. Good point, good point. Thanks for that. Turning to you, Birgi, I mean, in Estonia, you are known as the person who has done a lot to push for cyber security education and digital literacy and, and uh, educational curriculum. So uh, as we updated these types of in indicators in our National Cybersecurity Index, expanding uh, the um, best practice or the recommendation, so to say, to have cybersecurity education already in early ages. Um, I, I, we, we, we couldn't think of a better person to have comment these things than you. So why would you say it is important for a country to have a systematic approach to cybersecurity education? Mm -hmm. For example, if your country needs 200 uh, cybersecurity experts, so, so you need to know where they're coming from and you have to start rising them now. So you're basically looking 12 years, uh, so where we get them? So we, we want to get them from university, then how many people we are needing in the university that you can have the talent pool? So example, 200 working in the field, so in a university maybe you need 60 people, maybe you have 100 master students. From out of that, maybe some of them will join your country or somebody else's this country. So, but uh, where these 60 or 100 people comes from? They need to come from somewhere. So you need to have a good cybersecurity bachelor level. So again, where they, they are coming from. So you are looking what is happening in high school level. So in Estonia, we have decided that um, to grow this kind of talent pool, we need to go from the first grade, start with them, and uh, we have written some small parts in the curriculum where the child gets the education around them. How my home is secure, how my school is secure, how my e-learning is secure. And uh, from the um, secondary school, they are already looking what is going on in their uh, society, what is going on in local authority to protect the school environment. So from that, we get this kind of interest to the cybersecurity. So this is uh, very um, curricular stuff, but of course, when you need talents, you need these 200, then you have to think uh, even more, uh, what is the extracurricular things. So in Estonia, basically we have uh, 9,000 students every year 
uh, from first to sixth grade taking cybersecurity tests. We have uh, half of the school in Est Estonia uh, are doing this test with the children. And uh, when we are going to seventh or ninth grade, there is uh, 4,000 students who are like young hackers. They don't know stuff, but they have done something. And we have to gather them to give them this good path that they are not going to hack their e-school or something, or do some other bad things in the social media. So we, we gather these students and then we work with the teachers. And of course, after that, then you will get these students to come uh, to in your bachelor level courses and things. So we have to look always 200 people. We need a lot of people uh, before that to gather. So I think um, because as you mentioned, Estonia is in uh, information society and we are very so dependent. I think all of the children need this kind of education and everybody could be a cyber talent because we need a lot of people, a lot of faces, like you see in my, my costume today. So there are women, there are men, there are elder people, there are young people, we need everyone. And maybe we can learn from 10 years old st student more that sometimes we can learn from them more. Well, yeah. Uh, important, important stuff. So, starting the, the, that raises lots of various questions, and I would call our listeners who are interested in, in uh, perhaps any anything more specific to write up questions in the workshop. We will uh, we will ask your questions. Uh, while we wait for that, Birgi, I was wondering. So, when you start uh, is talking about kids, and I like your point of the necessity to have both curriculum. Um, cybersecurity present in the school curriculum, but also the extra in the extracurricular activities. Mm, starting from a primary uh, age already, how easy or difficult is it to have uh, professors or teachers in school introducing these topics to children? Um, are you focusing on that, and and how is your cooperation with various uh, schools going in uh, there? Where? Uh, where do you find teachers who can uh, explain these things to kids at early age? Mm -hmm. Estonian education and this curriculum is filled with teachers. So this is very special in, uh, in the world that uh, the curriculum is made by teachers for the teachers. And the teachers community decided that this is this important topic. And therefore the teachers are behind that cybersecurity curriculum as well. Um, so this ordinary commoners level, this is quite okay because we have educational technologies who are preaching that cybersecurity is important and everybody should teach uh, when something happens and how we can solve it. But when it comes to talent, there is a little struggle that not if the teacher doesn't have experience of this cyber competition or how to run these kind of things, then uh, they are like reluctant to join. But uh, we have made it so fun. We are helping sometimes. We are asking the student te teams to bring the teacher on board to show them what you are doing. And now we have uh, 150 schools who are doing these uh, competitions. So we have 550 schools in Estonia. So one third is already on board. And we have teachers who understand cybersecurity and really want to come and work in the field. So we are a little bit afraid that these 200 people comes from the teachers because they already know how to work with people and then they are just learning their new profession. And when you say we, who is the we? Uh, we have uh, in Taltec, we have a good community, but we are working also with Tartu University and Tallinn University. So it's a joint effort, but also we are working with uh, NGOs who are working with the teachers. So it's a community who has decided and we have a nice Facebook group. Everybody can just join and everybody tries to make uh, Estonia a better place. So we are not saying that uh, if you are working in this field that you have to uh, can do that. We are saying everybody has to do it and everybody can discuss these things with us. So it's a community movement. Thank you. Thank you. I have many questions because I think uh, teaching and kids is something many of us can relate to. 
but I want to give a chance for all of us to speak and and Yosa uh, Pitz is very good to have you here from the Estonian CERT. So I admit uh, the requirement to have this solid cyber incident response cap capacities and capabilities something not new in our index but something that uh, is always been there because let's face it without the capacity to have um, cyber incident response uh, one cannot really t talk seriously about cyber security but sometimes i think it's all important also to repeat the um, the uh, evidence and and explain the elementary so uh, can you pl please perhaps tell us uh, why is it relevant uh, for countries to be prepared and to respond to cyber threats and why is it important for, to have a special cert uh, designated uh, with nationwide responsibilities for cyber incident detection and responses well Mela, thank you very much for the invite and um... It is true, we have to keep reminding people that there are threats, especially when uh, things start becoming good. When you actually reach a certain point, uh, people become complacent. And that is why we have to always keep it in mind. For, uh, for a country to have a good incident response system, it's, um, it's important because, uh, let's face it, there are going to come attacks. There are always attacks going on, and this is something that I feel does not get enough um, messaging. Uh, even right now, there are attempts at attacks, and all the job, all the work we've done up until this point is actually preventing a lot of attacks. That cannot be understated. Now, for uh, emerging attacks, um, as it has been said before, we are innovating always in this field. There are always new solutions. There are always more ways to actually do things. And uh, that's the same, because the more things you introduce to something, the more possible places to attack they become available. For example, I really like the analogy uh, for us blue teams, the defenders, we have to check the entire fence around our house. It, it can't have a single hole, but for the attackers, they only have to find that single hole and they're inside our fence. So it is not easy. And uh, for a... Um, for, uh, for Estonia, we have reached a certain um, standard that I would say is quite uh, up there in the world. So now it actually becomes a bit more difficult for us to find new ways to actually push it further. And uh, for one thing, we are sharing our uh, learned expertise very much, but something really important now has become sharing. And if I may open the thought, it's... Um, in European level, we have a very good sharing because uh, the NIS directive actually uh, well orders us to have this national cert. And uh, let me bring an analog to explain it. Um, for example, if you have a puzzle and you give each person one piece of the puzzle, and then you ask, what's the puzzle about? It's, um, I think you might get very creative answers, but most likely they are wrong. So for a national C cert, the idea is that they will get all the pieces of the puzzle and they actually see the big picture. And the big picture is, for, for example, gives us the example what we need in our country right now. What are the main threats we have to uh, address? And uh, this, is, this is the main role. Well, I, I agree with you and I understand that also it's uh, it's about having a strong team and a strong national CERT team, but it's also about the CERT keeping up the community, a trust-based ecosystem because, um, well, you are looking and reviewing the, uh, the network, but uh, there is also the requirement of the critical information infrastructure operators to notify you about... Um, incidents happening, how do you make that happen? Is it easy? Uh, is it sufficient if you have a, adopt a law? Uh, do you need to introduce fines? Is it sort of like a whip or carrot approach? And, and how, do you, how do you approach that? That is a very good question because uh, let's say you can't, uh, you can't create trust with a law and trust is what people what people need to actually share with you. So not only us, but other European member states, I know trust building is a very involved thing. For, for us, for example, we actually have four main events that we always do every year for different communities. 
And that's where we actually get to, you know, uh, see the people we are working with, actually see that, yeah, it's not just a faceless government or a faceless entity that we are dealing with. There are actual people behind it. And it's an ongoing effort. It's, uh, I, I think it cannot be understated. And we also have it mapped as one of our main priorities. And uh, sorry, what was the other part of the question? No, well, uh, well, there, there is, yes. Well, I understand you, you answered my question of the whip and carrot approach with the uh, underlining the need to build trust. Um, the whip part, I guess, is, is a law and, and introducing of fines. What are the carrots? Well, that's, um, let's say that the carrot in this case is you actually get something for reporting because as I talked about the Basel example, we have a pretty good situation over we, we get a lot of information from our partners and we have a um, duty to actually share it. But if we actually get input from the critical sector, from the involved victims, one thing is we know what to share to them as well. Because let's say uh, if you have an incident, you may have a good uh, IT security team, you may have the experience, but working for the company, they're how to say the horizons aren't maybe as broad as us who deal with a lot, varied, a lot more varied, um, a lot more varied um, right. incidents in yeah. this, right? So, for for example, if you turn to us with an incident, we can give an outsider perspective and also give further, uh, not just solve, help solve the incident, but we might see something that you might miss. Awesome. I think that uh, you underline a really important point here that when there is a requirement to notify uh, the national CERT with incidents, it is a two-way street. And I'm really glad to see the CERT Estonia emphasizing that, that it's, it's not just information going from the critical information infrastructure operators to the uh, government side, but also there is a way to give back, to share some wider trends um, reporting and information, uh, intelligence information on cyber that you can give back to the sector. So it's a give and take approach. Really useful. Maybe like short, fin fi like final question in, in this, in this like in, in, in intro remarks for yours. How easy is it uh, to get experts into the CERT Estonia? What, um, what do you offer? How do you get the talent? Because I am like for Estonian cyberspace to be secure, we need the top people to be uh, among your colleagues. How do you attract them? That is a very difficult question. For uh, In part, we actually grow them ourselves. We have the monitoring team that we actually search actively for young people who are mastering the degree or uh, just looking to get their foot in the door. For example, I started from the monitoring team as well five years ago. And uh, but <laughs> that's maybe a band-aid to a wider problem because of course we want to have people come from outside with a wider field of experiences rather than just grow, grow them up themselves. They, you might have a good expert but you know broader experience is very valuable and it's, it's certainly not easy especially for governments who have the language barrier as well. For private sector it can be a bit easier but in, in that sense uh, our parent company, uh, Information System Authority, is also doing some uh, events and, uh, how to say, driving up some public uh, interest in the cyber too. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll get there and uh, all the more experts will, um, will, pop up, yes. will pop up every year. Awesome. Well, thank you, Josep. Uh, turning to you, Commander. Um, military is a field more and more in cyber defense more generally. Um, more and more people who observe um, news about uh, Russia's warfare in Ukraine are focusing because we have all learned from the over the past nearly two years that cyber is not a separate part, but it but very often is part of a conflict as as demonstrated by Russia's attacks in uh, against Ukraine um, in cyberspace. So thereby we have this cyber, we have this military sphere and, and, the, and added up indicators as part of our national cybersecurity index in the military sphere. So why do you think is it significant to develop military cyber in, uh, entities that is designated units responsible for the cybersecurity of military operations? 
or cyber operations? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, the, the key thing we've learned from the Russia-Ukraine war as an example, and there's been plenty of other examples prior to, is you can't just throw people at the problem and expect results quickly. This is a profession, it's a very complex environment, cyberspace in general. Um, sometimes you may do more harm than good. And we'll, we'll share a lot of the same words uh, for C-certs. So you need to train a professional cadre uh, to know how to understand the problem set, how to work with other entities, other governments, other cyber teams. So when there is a crisis and there's a lack of capacity, when you do call in the military, you have professionals that are responding. It may take time for them to resolve the issues if they can, but you at least have people that aren't gonna do more harm than good uh, overall. Good. What do you think, based on your experience, uh, what are the trends amongst NATO allies uh, and partners regarding cyber defense exercises among the military? Uh, I, it's becoming fa fantastic. Uh, it's seems that every week we have another cyber uh, exercise somewhere in the world, somewhere amongst the allies or uh, the nations, and not just NATO, but our partners and other like-minded nations around the world. Uh, it is definitely an upward trend. Uh, one of the bigger issues we see isn't so much that everybody has their own cyber exercise, it's building those uh, transnational relationships. Uh, not only do you have to train your own countrymen and your own government resources and agencies to work together. But as we're seeing from a capacity perspective, and from a talent pool perspective, we rely on each other as well. Cyberspace is global. So we have to rely on our allies, our partners, industry. Key, key factor here is working with our industry partners, not so much in a you know authority perspective, but understanding that they can report and let us know what's going on and also that we can actually assist them at some point in time when we get the authority to do so. What are some of the exercises that you are involved with in the NATO CCDC or you say there's something going on every week? Uh, can you bring us some examples of, uh, of uh, useful exercises from your own experience? Sure, uh, just right now, uh, we Cyber Coalition, Cyber Flag, uh, we have our own exercise, uh, Cross Swords coming up here shortly. But around the world, uh, the Brazilians, we have a lot of stuff going on in the US and the Far East and amongst NATO itself uh, at the national level and across NATO. So lots of things to do. Uh, there's a bit more focus on the technical aspect. We're still, as, as was stated by the other colleagues here, uh, it's a growing uh, and expanding area. So you have to constantly keep uh, up to date on the, on the technology and the skill set, but also, how we do cyberspace, how government gives us authorities, how government tasks us, and how we interact with our industry partners is key as well. So it, you can't just throw people in an environment, expect them to understand how to work together. It's based on humans, it's based on relationships. So if those aren't there prior to, it doesn't actually necessarily help if I have a technician that understands how to do something, if they don't understand how to interact with their, whoever we ask them to interact with. So I understand that just like in the ministries of uh, foreign affairs, also it is among more and more militaries that uh, cyber defense is something where people are focusing, where uh, special cyber commands are being set up, cyber commanders, designated units, and but moreover uh, than just national capabilities in this field, it's important for countries to work together. Uh, so to, to learn to train together, uh, exchange information, and uh, there's a lot of that going on at the NATO Cyber Center of Excellence, uh, but, but even beyond that regionally uh, as well. Very well. Well, let me check if we have come up any questions uh, from the audience. Um, uh, and and while uh, while we give people more chance to to ask questions, I uh, would like to to ask you, uh, like all, a more more general question. I mean, we have come here uh, to discuss the uh, the the relaunch uh, of the um, cybersecurity index in Estonia. Why uh, do you think some countries do better in cybersecurity than others? 
start by saying that we are a product of our experiences growing up. And for, um, for some countries, unfortunately, they may, may have a bit belligerent neighbor or maybe a bit more difficult uh, history. So that shapes the perspective. It, it lets the threat of something happening materialize better. For example, we've had attacks and we have constant uh, probing. And that has given us the mentality that we need to deal with it. It is something that's always on the mind. Right. So for Estonia, it's the serendipity of, of being in the geographically and geopolitically located where we are. We've always had our threat perception very sharp and we have had that tested up early, early relatively early down, down the line. Uh, kind of in, in the same way. Um, I think those countries that are not paying so much attention to cybersecurity right now, I mean, the hard truth is, is that they have not been hit bad enough. Because in the end, uh, building up cybersecurity capacity um, or different institutions and internal cooperation, that's a political question. Because cybersecurity does not come cheap. So you need this uh, political buy-in. And to get the political buy-in, you need some kind of input there. You bring in money, which is important. I think uh, an important dimension. And, and uh, when I asked you yours up earlier about how to get talent, I think wages and decent salaries are part of the part of the secret also of of getting uh, people um, to join the national cert. But uh, increasing that le level of, of, of the money talk, um, how much do you think the budget uh, of the IT development should be allocated to, to cybersecurity in, in a country? And how important is it? Or how, what are some of the ways of, of, uh, of increasing that percentage in, at, at the national level? Any good thoughts here <laughs> or ideas? Maybe I can open for the public sector. We usually bring out that the 10% of the IT uh, budget is usually something you should strive to aim for because, well, to open it up a bit more, uh, maybe from the private sector uh, perspective as well, it's uh, you have to evaluate what you get for the budget spent, especially if you, you have a business process. You cannot, if you, are, if you aren't doing the business of cybersecurity, then you want your main revenue stream to actually generate revenue. And then you invest it in cybersecurity to actually keep the revenue stream secure. So it's always a tough question, like where is the sweet spot where you get enough security, but you other, uh, other things you have to actually do to not suffer from it. I would actually agree. And, and within the Estonian government, there have been different talks about kind of setting this this kind of governmental goal but i i think that the that the answer is is also has as a more complex um uh, kind of background and the, the more complex background is is to do with a public private partnership and, and how do we look at the big tech how um how much do we insist on security by design or some uh, experts are also advocating for security by default uh, so, if anybody can share some good practices of, of working with the private sector uh, and, and bringing them in more. Birgi, for example, I, uh, you mentioned earlier the importance of extracurricular and I've seen lately in Estonia some quite innovative uh, cyber security games for younger children. Is that something that you think is a trend to continue or are there other ways you could uh, uh, um, recommend in uh, in seeing cooperation with the private sector. Yes, these kind of tools uh, what with we have been developing like a card games and things. It is uh, nice to put your logo in there, and all of the children will get this information, but also your partners. Um, you were t talking about where you get your good people, but your organization has a very good reputation amongst uh, youth because they are, you are coming with the youth to work with them, make training camps with them, and who they will turn after where they are thinking of what kind of occupation to take. It is the names I know. Microsoft is known by everybody. Everybody wants to work in a Microsoft. This is the same. In cybersecurity, it's more, most important what is your reputation, but also how you approach people and what to do with them. And I think among women, 
your organization in cybersecurity has a very good uh, reputation because they see it is a place where I can flourish. And later on, you are going to different places uh, and uh, changing the world. It's, for me, it's like a Skype where you have a lot of uh, under uh, programs and a lot of companies are rising up. So this is the same. I'm seeing a lot of women working later on in very good places after they have been part of your organization in five years. So cherish that as well. Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, I remember when I started, there was a kind of big, uh, how to say, um, gender uh, difference. But uh, so we did think like, why is it so? Is, is tech so uh, intimidating from the outside? And well, for, in some cases it did appear so. So yes, we actually put some effort into it. And it's one thing, of course, yeah, is to, um, to find the, well, so-called so advertise the field, because sometimes just there are some very obscure fields and it seems so very, um, so very uh, difficult and uh, hard to learn from outside, but it's not always so. But of course, uh, from the more technical perspective, the private-public cooperation can take the form of, uh, well, even in uh, government, we use the tools and software that is developed by outside usually. And uh, the government, I understand, can be a pretty good customer in some cases, some cases not so good, but generally uh, we do give a lot of uh, input to cybersecurity tools especially. Very good, and that reminds me this uh, this uh, this need to explain and advertise the field yet another fair uh, sphere where I think uh, the uh, Estonian cert and more generally uh, the RIA is is doing a very good job in in raising awareness of cybersecurity, doing public uh, public threat uh, assessments regularly, publishing and thereby raising the overall um, awareness. Uh, but also the general cybersecurity literacy of people uh, explaining what's been going on in cyberspace, explaining some of the big incidents and thereby making sure that people know that things happen um, and explain it in a way that everybody can understand. Um, we are uh, nearing close to the end of this panel. Any sort of like last thoughts or takeaways regarding these specific fields or the, or the need of, of various indicators, which ultimately is about where should governments who want to get better in their cybersecurity focus? Uh, and uh, borrow the analogy of, of Josep of the puzzle. I think the, the it's also like a puzzle, actually, that it's a really good tool for any country to see where they are lacking their cap capabilities or, or policies. It, it, it isn't about ranking in the end. It is about really seeing what is still missing. I'd like to add that uh, the one thing I do enjoy about having an index, and these will adjust over time as we get more and more fidelity, is it at least gives decision makers, non-cyber experts, somewhere to start to start asking the questions of why are we this score or not. It doesn't necessarily matter what the score is. It gives them a framework to start asking for the questions and at least start asking maybe partner nations or friends or allies who may be doing better, uh, how and why are you doing better and what could we do different? So I, if nothing else, it gives uh, senior decision makers and non-cyber experts something to start with. Awesome. Well, um, thank you very much, Donald, Birgi, Josep. Jake, thanks very much for joining me in this session today, discussing the indicators. Um, it's been a true pleasure uh, sharing thoughts with you and uh